It's an exciting time, and this morning we're going to be looking at, by the zeal of the Lord, how everything that led up to this point in time was set forth from the beginning of time. And as Jesus enters Jerusalem, he is there on a mission with a purpose, fully knowing and understanding the journey that he's on. Um, about 16 months ago, 18 months ago, I started on a journey looking for the next state pastor for the state of Michigan with the Church of God. I didn't know exactly where that was going to lead me. The good news is, is this weekend I had to go down uh, on Friday. Uh, Friday night we, we interviewed our last candidate, and it looks like we're moving towards wrapping it all up on the time schedule that we were given. And I'm looking forward to that. I've really enjoyed the time that I had uh, with the people who were on that committee with me, or that team. And I've enjoyed the process of it. And even this week as we were interviewing the person, some things came to mind. I was like, oh, I need to work on and do better at those things that we're talking about that we need to be doing. And one of those things is, I haven't done lately, but I was able to get it done for the day, is if you go to the Version Bible app, you can follow along uh, with the slides and the notes. You can take notes on that. And so uh, you can find that, uh, the Bible app, uh, on your mobile device um, and, and do that. If you don't have it, it will be up um, for several hours today. So even after you leave here, you can go back and review it, notes, save it. And uh, if the Lord speaks through you, to you through it today, uh, put that out there for you. So Jesus has, has been on a journey with his disciples for three years. And the thing about it is, is everything from his birth to this point has been prophesied in old. And sometimes we can look at Scripture and we think we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And what we have is the Old Testament is what sets us up to discover who Christ is is and how he wants us to be. It is all one continual story from the beginning of creation to the cross, the resurrection, and the beginning of the church and God's kingdom coming to be that we are in today. And, and looking at it all and bringing it all together, the triumphant entry and what it means with the prophecy being fulfilled in Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the full of a donkey. So Jesus is entering Jerusalem. And the fact is his whole ministry was pointed toward and leading to this moment. He has sent his disciples in to get this colt donkey. And they have with it its mother following behind as they come into the city. And he's entering the city as a king would enter. But see, uh, a king would enter on a steed. The best horse of the kingdom. And he would be coming either from a victory or, 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 or a summit in which he has shown his power in the world and he's coming into his city and the people are there cheering him on. But Jesus comes humbly on a donkey. Understanding what is going to happen next once he's come into the city. And the people that cheer him that day will not be cheering him in a few days. They'll be cheering, crucify him. He understands it. And he rides in on this journey to the cross. Jesus has come to Jerusalem. And there he will fulfill God's plan for our rescue. A plan from the beginning of time. In Isaiah 53, 2 through 12, 
He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was born in a manger to a carpenter. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the <clears throat> chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we, like, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that <clears throat> before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people, and then made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no, no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put to him, he was, has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear, bear their iniquities Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Seven hundred years before Jesus has entered the city, the prophet Isaiah is letting know what the Son of God will do for you and me. Though we have sinned, He bore our sin, even though He had not sinned. He gave His soul so our souls could have eternal life. It was all part of the plan of God to rescue us from our brokenness, our selfishness. Christ's purpose is to save the world. His plan requires the cross, death, and humiliation of Christ. Also God's plan for his kingdom to come. In Isaiah 9, 2 through 12, the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his <clears throat> for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every booty... Of the, tramp, of the tramping warrior in the battle tumult, 
and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. There will not be an end to his kingdom, and there will not be an end to the peace that he brings us. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forever, forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of host will do this. God sent his son to die on the cross with zeal. From the beginning of time. Think of things that you do with zeal and excitement. And God sends his son with zeal. Think what that means for you. God not only desires for you to be in communion with him, he has made the greatest, the greatest sacrifice with zeal that you might choose to come to him through Jesus Christ. God set in motion at the beginning a time to rescue and save you. God understands our brokenness, our selfishness. He knows our little dark secrets, and yet He loves us with zeal. Jesus is entering Jerusalem. And his disciples with him, even though Jesus has is, is told them all that is going to take place, it has to be done, they're probably pretty excited. Here they're coming into the main city of their people, the main religious center. And they're coming with the rabbi of all rabbis. They've seen him heal. They've seen themselves heal because he has sent them out to heal, to cast out demons to make the blind see. And now they get to come into Jerusalem. And I'm, I'm sure there has to be some excitement within them. Man, what's going to happen here? So Jesus comes into the city, and he goes to the temple, and he starts tipping over table, tables, and starting to set straight that which religious leaders have gotten crooked. He goes straight to the temple. To those who are the money changers, you see people who would come to Jerusalem to worship, they would come from up to 16 different pro providence. 16 different currencies, 16 different ways of, of speaking, but they were coming to Jerusalem to worship the one God in the one way they were called to worship him as Israelites. And their journey often was too long for them to bring their own lamb or their own dove. So they'd have to bring money or goods to trade. And they would come in to the temple thinking they had enough for five doves or for a, a lamb. And they would get there and they would find they only had enough maybe for one dove. Because people were trying to prosper off of what God wanted men to do out of the love of their heart, worship Him. And so immediately when Jesus gets there, He starts ruffling feathers, causing issue. teaching that God doesn't want us to be religious. He wants us to be in a relationship with him. 
He wants us to love one another. He wants us to love and worship God. Out of pure love and pure joy. And throughout that week, Jesus will break up norms and thoughts about how people viewed one another. From how people viewed the religious leaders to how people viewed women. How people viewed what mattered in the world. Also, he could hang on the cross and die for our sins. There are three things for us to take from the triumphant entry. Jesus understood the journey he was going on into Jerusalem. He understood that he was going in to Jerusalem to be that lamb that was born in Bethlehem, that was without blemish. And he went there willfully. I think one of the greatest prayers of Jesus we know is when he prays, Lord, not my will, but your will. Lord, not my desire, but your desire. And if your desire is for the cross, my desire is for the cross. His willingness to follow the purpose that God had laid out for him from the beginning of time is what sets us free from our brokenness. Jesus is not a worldly leader. He is a humble, sacrificial leader. He rode on in on a donkey. The creator of the heavens and the earth, the one that spoke everything to existence, rode in on a donkey colt to Jerusalem, a city that he should have rode in on the greatest steed that there ever was. with the richest robe that had ever been worn. With not only all of Jerusalem cheering him, but all of the world cheering him. But he rode on a donkey with his humble clothing and his humbled heart. showing us a way that we can love one another is through humility and sacrifice. Seeking others and not ourselves. Surrendering so we can have everything that God has for us. God sent His only Son to the cross with zeal. Think about that. I have three sons and a daughter. I could not imagine having a plan to send one of my sons to be sacrificed for a friend, let alone alone for people I do not know let alone for people who do not know me, do not respect me. God sent his son to die on a cross for the people who hate him. Think about that. For those whose hearts are bent against God, God sent his son to die on the cross for them so they might be forgiven, that they might be restored, that they might have true hope, love, and grace. God sent his son to forgive humanity for all that it had done against him in hopes that they might live for him. Here's the greatest thing about that. We should be filled with zeal, hope, and passion because of that. 
Because God is not going to hold our sins against us. Those things that we have done to hurt others will not be held against us if we seek Christ as our Lord and Savior. And here's the thing. We don't even have to do anything to undo the hurts that we've caused. Christ has already done it. We just need to receive it and let that love transform us and lead us and guide us to be that same love, to be that same grace. Some of us here today, we don't only need to be forgiven, we need to forgive others. Not because they've asked for forgiveness, but we need to forgive them so we can be free of the hurt and pain. Some of us here today need to be forgiven for what we've done. Not last week, but maybe today. Maybe yesterday. But the greatest thing is this. All we have to do is humble ourselves, confess our sins, and accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we are free. And it's done. That's the hope that we have. That's the freedom we have in Christ. We don't have to look to be a better person. He will make us a new creation. He will mend that which is broken. We need to trust Him to do the work in us. And we must seek Him and His will for it to come. We need to seek God that he'll give us a new mind and a new heart and a new passion. We need to seek him so he will give us the grace that is needed for us to forgive others. We need to seek the humility of Christ so we can truly love one another. But I find it exciting to think what God has done for us. And during this this week leading into Easter, often we can take a a somber heart, which is, is rightfully so, but we should always be filled with the joy because the victory has been won. No matter how much we struggle to be who God wants us to be, no matter how many things seem to be against us in life, the victory has been won in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you praise for this day. Lord, we thank you that we could come into your house of worship. We thank you that when we come together, you are with us. We thank you that when we go out, you are with us. Lord, we ask that you will empower us through your Holy Spirit to be the hands and feet, that we will be your servants. We will be the light. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Let's stand.